General Assembly of Ottawa uh, from 1977 to 1981. After that, uh, he became responsible uh, for the code for the conflict of interest at the cabinet of the Prime Minister uh, Brian Mulroney from uh, 1987 to uh, 1990. Uh, he became the Director uh, General of Election Canada from uh, 1990 to 2007. After that, he was the President Director General of the Internal Foundation for Electoral System in Washington from uh, 2007 to 2009. He is now a member of the Canadian Council for Civil Liberties. Uh, today, we, uh, the way that we will proceed is uh, I have 10 questions for uh, Mr. Uh, Kingsley. And uh, after each question, we're going to take, uh, after each uh, answer for, for the question, we're going to take two questions from from the from you people, instead of waiting at the end completely. So if you are interested by the subject that we talk, then we can ask questions to Mr. Kingsley. C'est correct, ça va? Okay, fine. Okay, uh, the first question that I have for Mr. Kingsley, and he was very interested to talk to you about that, is the reform of the electoral system uh -huh. in Canada. <laughs> on the, it was supposed to, uh, to happen, and it didn't happen. So, uh, uh, so my question uh, for you, Mr. Kingsley, is what do you think about that? Good morning to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Obviously, I'll be more than happy to answer questions in French. It happens to be my first language. <coughs> and uh, this is the language I spoke on these benches uh, 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. Or a little bit less. 55 years ago. Uh, both a baccalaureate and a master's degree. So, uh, I'm pleased to be back here, and we'll be happy to answer questions and to entertain the discussion in either official language. Uh, I have been apolitical all my life. But that does not mean that I don't follow politics. I've been following politics all my life. Now that, by the way, is one of the essential criteria for becoming chief electoral officer of Canada. Unwritten, but certainly the way that things have happened. Uh, since 1920, Canada was the first country to establish an independent officer, independent of government, answering directly to Parliament for the running of elections. The first in the world. <coughs> Something of which I think we got, we Canadians have been very proud of. I was the sixth chief electoral officer, and uh, McMiran was the seventh, and I think that's, yes, six and seven. The average stay is 17 years, and I stayed to the end of 17 years. Okay. You're appointed until you're 65, at least when I was appointed. Now you're appointed for 10 years. That 10 years is a long time. We've been dealing in Canada with electoral reform <coughs> because it was part of the platform of the Liberal Party of Canada for the 2015 general election platform quite clearly stated that the 2015 general election would be the last one under first past the post. That's how we call our system at this time. First past the post means it doesn't matter how many candidates are in a particular election, the one who obtains the most votes gets the seat. You don't need a majority. If there are 100 candidates and they all split the votes equally but one of them gets one vote more, when that person is elected. That's first pass the vote. And issues have arisen because of the first pass the post, which people became more conscious of all the time. By the way, I'll take a little bit more time than the other questions, because some of the other questions are great. I know what the questions are. Tell me your favorite questions. <laughs> well, this one deserves the attention of the Indians, frankly. And, and what we found was that we started to live with more than two parties fielding candidates. And those parties having success at the polls. So that effectively we started to have three parties that were vying successfully for elected office at the polls with candidates. And we quite Rightly, we're proud of this because it, you know, there's more than two ways of envisioning life, political life for the country. We now have 
now have about 20 political parties at the federal level, five of which obtain success at the polls, as recognized by how the seats are allocated in the House of Commons right now. One of them has only one seat, another one has only four seats. But when we started to view the, the results, people, academia became aware of the fact that if you obtain 40% of the votes at an election, you got 60% of the seats. So people became more and more aware of this. After academia, the media started to pay more attention to this phenomenon and started to report on this after general elections. Oh, 39.5% of the votes gets you 58% of the seats or whatever the percentage is. So we were getting a majority government, which unto itself some people consider to be an advantage. But with a minority or not a majority of votes, an important plurality of votes. And people like Fair Vote Canada started to also underline the fact that 9 million people at the last election voted for a candidate who's not elected. That's about half the votes. And they started to propose a change in the system to have a proportional system. So the government, in order to <coughs> meet its commitment, established a committee on electoral reform. Initially, they established it by saying, we'll establish it in accordance with the rules, which is the majority liberal party. <coughs> membership. That's how committees are established. They reflect the House of Commons. They don't reflect the popular vote. There was a lot of uh, upheaval of this, and the, the government acquiesced to the request <coughs> that the membership be changed such that it more accurately reflected what we would call the popular vote. So that meant that the liberals were now a minority on the, on the committee. The mandate of the committee was to study alternatives to first past the post. The mandate of the committee did not say, <coughs> you must recommend a specific alternative. This left the government, in anticipation of the report that would be received, the option of deciding what kind of system it could put forward. And if it wanted to proceed at all. So, the committee held deliberations. <clears throat> By the way, it took six months for the committee to be established and to, to run after the election. An important six months when we consider how tight the time frames are to change an electoral system between two elections. And many people felt that a good four months were lost. That it shouldn't have taken that long to establish the committee. Be that as it may, <clears throat> the government said, you must committee must report by December 1st. Now, what the committee did is that it, it traveled across the country. It worked incredible hours during the summer. It's very rare for parliamentary committees to work during the summer, but they did, much to their credit. And they heard untold numbers of Canadians, so-called experts, people who cared, about what kind of system Canada should have. And they, they were able to even have international expertise brought forward, uh, New Zealand, the other countries. How did you go about changing your system, or how does your system work? There were really, there are really three basic systems of election. One is first past the post, <coughs> which very few countries still have. Very few. The States, Britain, uh, and a few others. That's the first one. Another one is a preferential ballot. That is to say where you rank candidates. Let's say there are five candidates for one seat. You rank them, one, two, three, four, five, in order of preference. If number one, the first count, doesn't obtain more than 50% of the votes, you obliterate, you eliminate the last candidate. This is generally how it's done. And you move that candidate's second choices upwards. And if you still don't have 50% of the votes, or more than 50% of the votes, you then eliminate 
the lamp, the other one that's remained, the penultimate one now, until you have at the top one candidate who, after having flipped one or two or three candidates of resistance and flipped the votes upwards, gets the C, the D, finally, she gets 50% plus one or more of the votes. That's a preferential. And this was what the Prime Minister eventually said was his preference. The other mode is kind of a proportional system, and there are variations on proportional. But what proportional systems attempt to do is to reflect in the seats how people voted in proportion. That's what it's called, a proportional system. So that those nine million that voted for someone who was not elected at the last election would see their votes reflected in the House of Commons. The other one of the other shortcomings of the first pass of the first pass the post system in the Canadian context is that we now find that we don't have any seat held by the Conservatives east of Quebec. All of Atlantic Canada, no Conservatives. In the West, we have fewer Liberals, fewer NDP than we should have. Significantly, we have provinces that have only Conservatives. People kind of might say, well, that's what, that's what the system gives you. But basically, what we're dealing with is that every system is a compromise. What we have to decide is, are the compromises that we're making under first past the post <coughs> acceptable? Or do we want to switch to another set of compromises, which we find more acceptable? But then, when the committee reported, it reported, we studied Parliament, the report of Parliament, Parliament, we studied the systems, and we're telling you we recommend a proportional system. Now, the Liberals on the committee said, we don't agree. If they'd been the majority, that would have been the end of it. But it wasn't. Because people, MPs, who represent parties, whose candidates obtain 60% of the votes or more, favored the recommendation that there be a proportional system. What that meant is that the government now has to respond by the first of May or the But initially, they were told, the government was told, we the committee favor a proportional system. You devise a system. So this left the government with the option of devising a system that it could find acceptable. The problem is that it's very difficult to arrive at a proportional system which gives you a majority at first swath without involving another party. And the Prime Minister said, there's no public support for this. I'm not detecting any public support for any kind of system. And I prefer preferential ballot. He actually said that. Okay. And he said, therefore, it's being removed. Now, the committee did not engage Canadians Thoroughly, they depended on the media how they would do. There was no real social exchange. Because nowadays you can exchange with Canadians with this little gizmo called the phone, the iPhone. And other brands, by the way, this is not a commercial. <laughs> <laughs> to engage in a two way communication. What has happened since then is that people are beginning to react. To the Prime Minister's decision. There's a, a poll that came out, and I'm going to finish with this, uh, that question. Where the majority, no, not the majority, the reality, forty-five percent of Canadians generally agree with the Prime Minister's decision. Thirty-eight percent do not, and seventeen percent are not sure. Keep that in mind for a minute. And then we go to young people, 18 to 24. 36% agreed with the decision, 46% did not. 17%, the same as the other, were unsure. So effectively, the results were flipped. 
at the last election, the participation rate of young Canadians, 18 to 24, went up from 38% of the previous election to 58%, 20%. 20% on a population of 4,800,000 people. The Conservative Party obtained the same number of votes minus a couple hundred thousand than at the previous election. The NDP lost a million votes. Most of them must have gone to the liberals. And the young people are the difference. So in effect, what is really astounding about these numbers, about the general population, and about the young people as well, is the fact that people are upset with it, even though there's been no discussion on what kind of proportional system we should have. I am so encouraged by this poll. It means that if they knew what the alternative is, they would be making a decision based on fact. But here they don't even know. They, when, you, when you're asked to deal with, you want to get rid of what you have, and I don't, I'm not going to tell you what you're going to have, people will all automatically tell you, I want what I have. Okay. But here they're telling us, very closely, if you mix the two, we'd like to know what, what it is that we didn't have here. We'd like to know what kind of proportional system. There are various models. But one of the models which has been touted by the committee in its report are uh, similar. There's several that are mentioned. It's called a localized proportional system. And very briefly, what you do is you gather four to eight of our conventional writings or circumscriptions that exist now in a city, for example. A city like Ottawa, that, let's say it has 20 writings, 20. Well, you can say, OK, uh, you will have four writings and five MPs each. So that's localized proportional. Proportionality will only be among the five. You can vary that between three and eight if you wish. Don't go beyond eight necessarily. But, so you've got local, localized proportion. What that means is that for any party to elect a member, they have to get a certain percentage of the votes, and that would equate to about 10% if it's six or seven candidates. I haven't done the math, but just off the top of my head. So that this big scare that the small parties with one MP or two or five could swing completely a government around is, is really under a Canadian, under this approach, something that is not based in reality. Where that is a problem is when you have a proportional system which is based on a nation. The whole country votes and the lists are prepared by parties. Here we're not dealing with lists that are prepared by parties. The local writing associations, which would be the same as exists now, except larger, okay, they, their membership would decide who are the candidates that we're fielding, the five candidates that we want. And what could easily be achieved is you could say, we want you to rank three women and two men. So there may be seven women running for office in that riding who want to represent the party, and maybe five men. But people would rank three and two. And then you would have a woman, a man, a woman, a man on their map. Running for office for that riding. We could achieve parity, gender parity, inside one election. Right now we're 26%. Guess which way? And this is 2017, which is two more than 2015. Okay. okay. So that's what I wanted to introduce. <laughs> what is the state of democracy? Uh, no, uh, 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 is there any question? Yes, madam. Um, I just wanted to because I, I found the debate on electoral reform really interesting because people would sort of complain about things that were germane to what the discussion was. So oh, there's a long lineup of the polls. My poll worker didn't know what they were doing, etc. So I was wondering if you could distinguish between electoral modernization and electoral reform, because I think that was kind of lost in the conversation. Because I, I believe we badly need the modernization. And 
I'm not yet sold on the reform, if that makes sense. I don't blame you for not being sold on reform, because you don't know what we're talking about. The Canadians don't know what we're talking about. Yeah. What, what is that, that apple there that people are offering? The government said, we don't even want you to know about that, because we're taking it off the table. And it won't happen that way, by the way. There's going to be, there is starting to be popular movements to resurrect this idea. And with the statistics I've given you about youth participation and involvement in this, that's bound to get people's attention. Because young people voting, a 20% increase is major. They're the, people who, they're the people who stopped voting, 18 to 24. They never started. Electoral reform is what I've discussed. Modernization of elections. We can go into electronic voting from a remote location. Uh, in terms of the process of voting, as a former chief electoral officer, I will tell you that we're doing very well. Now, there may be instances where we can improve. Uh, access for the disabled can be significantly improved you know, because of modern technology that is now offered. You could do that at the polls. That can. That's separate. What we're talking about is the way that representation occurs when you cast that vote. Is what we're talking about when we talk about electoral reform. Mm -hmm. Now, there's other questions that have come to the fore. You know, and I think it's one of the questions here: Should we have an elected senate? Should the prime minister's office have all the authority that it has? And I can tell you because I was there. The authority of the prime minister's office started, the centralization of the authority started with Pierre Elliott Trudeau. He modernized the system of cabinet because ministers were just coming in, making a proposal to cabinet, and away they went. Because that's what they had in mind. And Pierre Elliott Trudeau said, when ministers make decisions, I want to know about it first, so that all cabinet would know, and we get the points of view of all the members of cabinet. So he instituted the system of memorandum of cabinet. And I say that I know that because I was then at the Treasury Board Secretary. Okay. And so, but what has happened ever since, and this is something that is so natural, it's not even funny. The people who run that machinery saw this as an opportunity to centralize authority and power, which is a dirty word, more and more over time. So, you can even have that power to such an extent that you say to somebody, I don't want you to say to a minister, I don't want you to exercise any initiative in this area. Don't bother us. I mean, this is where you know, people have started to feel, and, and this has occurred gradually over each prime minister since the introduction of that. The motivation was great. Everybody agreed with it. But then people start to like the greater authority. That's why people say that our prime minister constitutionally has more authority than a lot of leaders in, in, the, in the Western world. And this has accentuated this. So that's another change to be brought about. How do we do it? I don't know. That's not the purpose of this session. But those are modernizations. You know? The role of the MP is another one. The independence of the role of the MP in representing the test, the uh, people who elected the people in this particular writing and, and uh, the independence of thought. The, initially in Canada, and this is a phenomenon that occurs in the States today, some Republicans will vote for a, a Democrat motion and reverse. We see that very rarely in Canada. We're seeing a little bit more now because of the independence of vote. And, you know, you're not subjected to the whip for a particular vote. Issues there. You never, you'll never see that for the budget if that's what you know, the federal government stands for financially, and that's major. But there are other issues. Now, I'll come back to one point that I made because some, some of the people are saying, you know, well, you know, the role of the MP is to represent the points of view of his constituency. And it's supposed to be the total view of his constituency. He represents all the constituents. And I say, okay. So let's have a debate on assisted dying. Well, these people in the writing favor assisted dying. These people in the writing don't favor assisted dying. How do you represent both? 
when it comes time to open. How do you represent that? With one MP on this type of issue. It's, it's a limitation on the present system. You Maybe what you do is, as an MP, you rise and you say there are two points of view here, uh, but I favor this one. You know, people want to see the, their points of view reflected in the vote. More and more. So this is viewed as well as a proof of the present system. Sort of extending on that. Thank you, Noah. I think it's a very uh, useful, you know, ongoing uh, pedagogical exercise. And uh, I've been struggling with this argument for about 45 years. Uh, about 45 years ago, I was a graduate student uh, in uh, Stockholm. Uh, I'm Canadian myself, but at least, you know, to observe uh, how the, just the operational part of it. And I would say, well, at the end of the day, you know, countries like going to the parliament as a, as a visitor, but the same thing I would say with Norway, Sweden, Finland, it was boring. You know, to go to the parliament because it was a proportional system and uh, you know nothing changed too much one way or the other and it was, it was always a coalition government so they were very much a, you know had a tradition of you know coalition government and, and getting along and not being theatrical or sensationalist and just sort of you know reflecting the will of, of, of the people in quotation marks and uh, you know my question is how can we you know Trans transition to something less uh, unfair. I mean, the characterization that I often have is it's a the system we have at the moment is sort of that's the big fish eats the small. Now, you know, in, in, in a proportional system, you try to be, you know, even out, you know, the try to take, you know, the big, you know, the Darwinism in the system <coughs> within the limits, you know, in Sweden you need 4% of popular vote to get a member in the parliament. And what happens, I find, in Canada, and in Australia, say, oh, proportional. They would say two countries with the letter I, Italy and Israel. I and mean, that would be the end of the conversation. Well, look at Italy and Israel, and oh, man. but you know, it's not, you know, that's one example of many. But uh, my feeling over the time has been, you know, we have to change attitudes. But I think more in the end, we have to change behaviors. And in terms of attitudes, I think our system, maybe we should. Like, produces great adoration. For example, Jean Lesage, 1956. He won a whole lot more votes than Daniel Johnson, but uh, the power went to Daniel Johnson. René Lévesque, he probably would have been Prime Minister of Quebec if you know, he hadn't had that little accident in 1966, and the history of Quebec would have been very, very different. Or in my own province in New Brunswick, Frank McKenna, he won 57 out of 57, he had no opposition, no voice for 30 people, and we had something called the Meats Lake Agreement, which went round in circles because there was no voice for 30% of the people. Anyway, my, my question at the end, how about experimenting with obligatory voting, like in Australia and in Brazil? I used to be against it for kind of like, you know, freedom of choice, right? But I think at the end, it would change behaviors and force us to confront the contradictions in the system. Well, I see two questions in your in your question. I'll answer the first one, uh, even though you did not pose it as a question, because I attempted to. I started to answer part of it. Those models of proportionality are at the national level in those Nordic countries, and the lists of candidates are prepared by the party. And this is one of the big concerns in Canada: how do we maintain the link between? the elected person and the elector, the elector being Jean-Pierre Kingsley. I want to know that I've got access to that MP if I have an issue with the government. Okay, I want to know the government. Their system stepped away from that and was viewed as granting too much authority to party apparatchnik. Okay, this is what the concern was. And under the localized proportional system, the candidates would not be, and the numbers would be limited. And I would then, as a Canadian, I would have a choice. I've got five MPs. I can choose amongst the five. I can get them to compete amongst themselves. I can get the liberal, I can get the conservative. I mean, if I'm still unhappy, I can go see the NDP one, if, if they're all elected. And, and that maintains a link, okay? 
with the because that person, that MP, is going to be interested in keeping my vote. He may not even have gotten it the first time, but he doesn't know that. Okay, but he's going to be interested in doing what he or she needs to do to satisfy me, which is what MPs do now when you have a particular issue. Okay, that is something else I saw when I was in the office. Now, mandatory attendance at the polls, and this is why I always present it that way. It is not mandatory voting. You cannot force a person to vote, not in the democracy. But you can require that somebody attend the electoral process, okay? Which is what the Australians do, which is what the Belgians do, which is, and I hesitate to say Brazil, because people don't associate with Brazil as readily as they do when I say Australia. Belgium is not as good as Australia in people's minds, and, you know, Brazil is even less. You get the picture that I'm drawing. Australians are us, except they don't have bilingualism. Okay, this is the way we do. Okay, that's what they are. They come from British tradition, colony, the whole bit. And if you went to Australia and you introduced the thought of get, getting rid of mandatory attendance at the polls, you would have an uproar. Because they're born with the feeling that this is part of the woof and fabric of democracy. We're born with the feeling that it ain't, that it is not. And therefore, we think it's a fundamental value to the electricity, just like the secrecy of the vote. Except that it's not, because we've seen that it works in other countries that look just like us. Okay? That's why comparisons with Italy, comparisons with Israel, comparisons, they don't, they're not. They don't look like us in terms of political reality. Okay? They don't look like us. They don't have our history. They don't have the woof and fabric of who we are. As a it's not the same history at all, which is why I'm not concerned about that happening here. But I know that that's the chestnut that's brought every time. There. So and at one moment in time, when, when the participation rate started to drop, and I was chief electoral officer, and the media started to realize this, and because we're publishing the results, Everything is known about the electoral system in Canada. We all produce, all CEOs produce fantastic reports. <laughs> the uh, a journalist asked, me, well, what do you think of mandatory uh, attendance on? He said, voting. And I replied, I said, well, you know, if this keeps up, we're going to have to start thinking about it. Well, you should have seen the reaction of the press. I have just committed a cardinal of sin. This is contrary, absolutely contrary to everything Canada stands for in terms of freedom of individuals. And you know, in Australia, they elect liberal governments, they elect conservative governments. It's not that which is the determinant of who gets elected. What you do have, though, is a society where people are provided with an opportunity and must realize that there are responsibilities attending upon freedoms. This is the way they do. And you get social cohesion through the electoral system. Because participating in an election is a manifestation of belonging to a society. It's also a manifestation of that you will adhere with the results, obviously, unless you're absolutely convinced, convinced that the results are not legitimate. They're not legitimate, yeah. And, but when you do go and vote and you see the results after, you say, well, that's how we voted, under the present rules. <coughs> what came out, that's under the present rules. So, that's my long answer. Both well, any other questions, sir? Yeah, your idea of a mixed uh, sort of direct and proportional system, might have been the way the government should have gone, it might have been the preference of the majority, but uh, at least to put to the Canadian people. But the government argued that any, I think they made another argument, that any form of proportional representation, however uh, however mixed with, with direct representation, would create uh, disunity and see the rise of special interest parties and break down sort of the national unity that is enunciated by these big big tent parties. However, the reality was perhaps they felt that, that they would be disadvantaged by any form of uh, proportional representation, which 
of course they never said, but was assumed to be one of the main uh, considerations in their decision. Practically every expert who was asked answered that a preferential system would have favored the liberals. The preferential system as well, yeah. Because if they were not the first choice, they would have been the second choice yeah. of people. And hence they would have had a majority forever. Yeah. Would that have been the reality? I don't know. But that is a perception that was generalized. And I don't want to attribute that to the Prime Minister as an intention. All I know is that's how the people testified. testified. Uh, there was a point that you were making. Oh, yeah. The, um, I'm sorry, I've got the thread of it. Create this unity. Uh, OK. It's, it's, it's absolutely, absolutely the reverse if you stop to think about it. If you need 10% of the votes before you elect mm -hmm. one MP, you get away from a minority group that obtains 0.5% or 3%, let's say, of the votes, getting, a, getting any kind of uh, power in the world. They would not be electing people. It's almost unfortunate. I wish people would get elected at 5%. Maybe we can play something, but play with the, the percentages. I don't know. The point is that the, lower, the, the lower the number of candidacies, the higher the number of required votes before you can elect somebody. I mean, that's a mathematical formula. That's nothing to do with it. Yeah. But if, if you stop to think about it, would we be better off if there were li more liberals out west for national unity? Would we be better off if there were more conservatives in Quebec for national unity? Would we be better off if there were conservatives in the East for national unity? What is this big tent when you're not getting people elected in, 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 in swaths of provinces? I got the feeling that it's a partial big tent that they're gaping holes in the big tent. Because, you know, Mackenzie King said it better than anybody else. Europe has too much history and Canada has too much territory. <laughs> we are an incredible territorial thing here. 36,500,000 people occupying the second largest country in the world, geographically. We somehow have made it work for 150 years. And my view is that this would be better for those who favor unity, it would be better to have a proportional system. So that you would hear the voice of a conservative in Prince Edward Island. I want to hear that voice. It's not 100 percent of the people who voted liberal. I want to hear that voice. And I'm not saying I agree with that voice. I don't I, I only agree with the fact that it's the people's voice. That's what I agree with. And it's it's not there. Of course, it is. Yeah. Monsieur, monsieur. Uh, uh, will the uh, electoral systems in Netherlands and France uh, decry recognition or give ad adequate recognition to the support of voters for right-wing populists like Marine Le Pen and, and Kurt, Kurt Blatter? There's a lot of questions. We yeah, we have, yeah, we have, we have, we could the discussion after the answer. No, 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 no,
advantages and disadvantages and settled on proportional, a proportional system as being what you're buying. That's all I'm talking about. Uh, but very few of the people who presented favored the rank ballot system. Very few of them. And the committee had a chance to ask questions as much as they wanted. I had as many experts who wanted to favor that system. So they heard everything they had to hear. They came up with one system. You know, could we eventually uh, re reintroduce that? I don't know. I don't think it would gain a lot of public support, but that's beside the point. It's a, it's a fair argument that you make. The thing I don't understand is why the Prime Minister walked away from that so quickly instead of appointing some very senior, respected person to go out and sell it to the nation. He just what ended it. This is, I think you're hitting the nub of the question right there. And it's a point that I was making. We haven't heard a substantive, we've not had an opportunity to discuss substantively the alternative that the committee favored, a proportional system. We've not had that opportunity. And I think with more and more people coming out, and I know there's a group forming in Canada that is uh, favoring a proportional system, localized as I've discussed, with different ways of choosing candidates and what I've discussed. But still favoring that. And we're going to see things being tabled in Parliament from ordinary Canadians. And I think that this thing has a good chance of taking wings so that we can come up. That doesn't mean you know, that we should go with a proportional system. It means that Canadians would know and would be able to identify it to, to state whether or not they favor it or keep keeping the first past the post system. And once we've had that discussion, then whatever it is that arises as a consensus in a democracy, that's how you don't leave people behind. By having listened to the people who have a different opinion and telling them that you've considered what they had done and that you've thought it through and you've heard all of the arguments, and you still, that this is what you favor. Okay? Because there are people who favor first past the post. They will favor first past the post, even if we decide to go with a proportional system. Eventually, it may not happen. This it may happen three parliaments from now. I don't know. It may never happen. But at least we will have addressed the issue in a meaningful and democratic way by having delved into it and having acted intelligently about it. That's the strength of our democracy in Canada, our ability to do that. Tiny final question. Do you think we need a referendum constitutionally or otherwise to, to, to approve a change in the system? Well, I've answered that to the media. We don't need one constitution. Okay. And what I also told the committee, and I, I think I was a third witness, is that two and a half hours. If we can gauge that there's a consensus after a thorough discussion in Canada, and, and that political parties, because it's a representative democracy, even though some of us consider it to be so much law. If we can gauge that we've engaged the majority of Canadians, that there's a public favor in this, I don't think we need a referendum. That's what I said. I just I finished reading Freedom House, the report, Freedom House report on the state of democracy, in order to prepare myself for this. And they don't have a lot of good things to say about referendums as, as a tool for in a democracy. It is a representative democracy. And if we change the system, it's still a representative democracy. It may even be more representative for all I know. Okay. Next question is a mix of three questions. Okay. Right. So uh, what is your... Uh, what is it? Yeah, we're coming. Yeah, yeah, we are coming. Yes, we are coming. Okay. 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 Okay, but quel regard portez-vous sur le monde? What is your view of the world today? Uh, what do you think about uh, populism? And do you think that Canada is immune from that? Well, I was just mentioning that I read the report on Freedom House, and I don't always appreciate some of the things that the Freedom House comes from, but said because they come from a particular perspective, but they generally do. And what they're telling us is that the world is in a is not a good place, and that for the last 10 years, democracy has been receding. Okay. 
and, and we've seen, and people are interpreting Brexit to have been a negative thing. Well, you know, the majority of the people who voted in Great Britain thought it was a positive thing. So, uh, that's, you know, because you don't agree with something doesn't mean that it shouldn't have been a democracy. That's all. That's all that means. Populism unto itself is not a bad thing. If it's a political party that is appealing to electors to what I would call a populist agenda, let's say that they favor, uh, let's say, less rapid social change, okay? That they want us to sit back and want society to sit back and absorb the latest changes instead of just continuing to go at 100, 200 kilometers an hour. But that's a, that may be a fair sentiment. And I hope I'm not making a mistake here, but I would associate the Reform Party of Canada to have been the populist movement. Something where people are saying, what is there now in the way of choices is not cutting it with me. And there's enough of us who think like me that we've got someone who's established a party where we can use this and let people know. And we will elect members. Now, when you get to extreme form of populism, that that is where racism, uh, anti-religious groups, uh, negative things in society, the elements that divide us as a society, when those are used, negative elements, I should say, then that becomes a form of populism, and I call that extreme populism, and that's not helpful. And what we're seeing is that there is this kind of approach, we're seeing it in former uh, Soviet bloc countries, more and more surprisingly pop Poland, more and more veering Hungary, the same thing. But what we're missing, and what is somewhat missing in, in the review that I read, is the longer term approach to democratic development. And by longer term, I mean viewing it in the, in the perspective of history. When uh, Chow and I, does anybody know who Chow and I was? One person does two, three. No? Joe and Lyon? Joe and Lyon. He was the right hand man to Mao Zedong. He visited, visited Paris in the, I think it was uh, 1965, the first senior, senior Chinese person to go to a Western country. And they asked him, What do you think of democracy? I'm paraphrasing here because I don't speak Chinese. <laughs> you know, because democracy then was. 200 years old, a little bit less. And he said, it's too early to tell. <laughs> well, we know that democracy is the only way that humanity can go. But I will relate some personal experience to you. And I've seen, because in 1990, when I was appointed chief electoral officer, elected by the House of Commons, by the way, the only person elected by the House of Commons into a job in Canada. Okay. Not even the Governor General is chosen that way. Chief Electoral Officers are. You can have a selection every time. The, uh, the, 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 no, the expression, the, uh, the personal, this was at the same time that the USSR caved in, in Poland. Okay, Gorbachev, Blasnost, Perestroika, the whole bit. And Elections Canada became solicited around the world for its expertise because people were recognizing in newly emerging or re-emerging democracies, they were looking around and saying, who's got something that works here with democracy? Who's got something that works? Oh, Canada. What's their electoral system? Oh an independent chief electoral officer, control on money, the whole bit. Okay, let's invite them to 
come and talk to us about elections. Let's go see them. So we were involved in untold numbers of countries. And we saw IFUS, International Fund that I eventually led, and the Europeans created something as well. The focus was on helping new democracies establish electoral systems, which is essential. There was some effort, uh, a lot by the Americans, on developing political parties. Okay, there were two, one Republican, the IRI, and the Democrats, the National Democratic Institute, and the other. They sent people, and they were funded by USA to do that in a significant way. So they helped political parties to form. But who was helping Supreme Courts establish themselves? Court systems, the independence of the courts. Who was helping media, free media? Who was helping NGOs, the other elements of democracy? Where were the United Nations in trying to help develop a democracy? Because it takes at least one generation, if not two, to get to a stage where people who are actually born in a system get to vote and enjoy the fruits of democracy. Understand what it is. I'll, get, I'll relate one example to you. There was a Hungarian uh, woman who worked for elections there, and I got to, got to know a number of people, got to know her. And she was visiting me in, in Washington as part of a trip at one time. And I think she must have been around 40. So I asked her at one time, I said, so, how are things in Hungary? How is democracy coming along? This was 10 years ago or something. She said, it's, it's working well, but you know, Jean-Pierre, every morning I wake up, and I look outside to see if they've come back. Who do you think they is? She did not have a feeling like I have, being born in lower down here, <laughs> without even knowing that there was such a thing as communistic regimes when I was six or seven years old, just enjoying the fruits of my parents, my family, and, and you don't even know you've got democracy and you still do. You've got the benefits of it. This affects us. How you're treated in school affects you. The values that are being inculcated, you don't even realize it. It takes a while. We did not, the international community, we are part of it. We did not think of developing, helping develop intergenerationally what democracy was. We focused on a couple of things. I remember, I remember when I was running elections here, and we would help a particular country, and then for, for that election, it's not for anything else. And then the next election, they'd come around and ask for more money, and, and remember the people of foreign affairs saying to me, well, what do they need money for? We helped them the first time. <laughs> wow. This is it. You get some money for your first election, and don't bother us. You're a democracy now. This is a caricature, a little bit of what I'm trying to say here. We did not fully grasp what was required. We did not act accordingly. When you thought, think of the untold billions that are spent on economic aid or other forms of aid, which are legitimate, but there was no way that we could think what it is that is required to change the mindset of a country, we did not do it. And therefore, those people who are there are saying, well, every action has a reaction. Okay. This is what happened in Russia. Russia never knew democracy before Gorbachev threw out Glashnikov's very story. Okay, we're moving in that direction. President Putin, years ago, I think it was his first mandate, turned around and looked at the state governors, 
who were elected and said, you're no longer elected. I appoint you. That's like the President of the States saying, I appoint the governors of the states. That's like the Prime Minister of Canada saying, I appoint the premiers. He did this in front of all of us. He barely, barely did anything. Every step he took, which was contrary to democracy, encouraged him to take the next one. And that's the other aspect of what's happening here. Now, do I think populism can occur here? The extreme form? We have certain strengths. We have strengths in institutions. But we have first and foremost, and I say this every time I ask that question, we have first and foremost that strength of democracy in each Canadian. That is the safeguard of our democracy. Our institutions are essential help that foment this, our Supreme Court, our independent officers of Parliament, our uh, loyal opposition, the functioning of Parliament. No, function, how do you get a Parliament to function? That's something else that we helped a little, but not major. It wasn't part of this country is really gung-ho on democracy. We would, in effect, go and uh, inform them, not tell them what to do. That's the other thing we've never done as election scandal. Never tell anybody what to do. Do you know what I was actually asked? When Jean Bernard, I, I, I ran the international mission for elections in Haiti in 2006. The elections were supposed to be in 2005. We sent 125 international observers. Jean Bernard, who was the executive director, was threatened with, by a crowd of machetes, so he left the country. I won't tell you who called me. They actually called me and said, John Barry, would you take over? And I said, are you crazy? <laughs> I said, how can I run an election in a culture that I do not understand? We in this country understand what the average Canadian understands, does not know everything about democracy, every institution, but understands democracy, understands the rights, the freedoms, because he or she lives them. It is at the foundation. That is the, the, the fail safe. And when we do have, should we ever have, political parties or candidates that offer negative populism, then let's make sure that they're not elected by voting for someone else. That's a safeguard. That doesn't mean that they'll never get elected. And if they do, then we deserve it. It's as simple as that. Monsieur, I guess, that populism. I want to mention something else about communism. Mm -hmm. It was a representative of the Belgian government that spoke at Carlton Friday. He was also a teacher in Beijing, a professor. He asked his students, is China system communist? The student said, no, but we're not allowed to say so. What was that he said? We're not allowed to say what? Um, the question was, uh, the professor asked, uh, is, uh, is China system communist? And okay. the student answered, no, it's not communist but we're not allowed to say so. so I, I, I'm not, I'm not, yes, this is a representative, a fairly high, an ambassador of some sort. They were speaking at a conference between Canada and uh, the European Union. The question, will the electoral systems in Netherlands and France deprive recognition or give adequate recognition to the support of voters for right-wing populists? Marie Le Pen and Gerd Fahrer. I think one can surmise that Marine Le Pen is, is a form of negative populism because she appeals to the anti immigrant symbol. That's a strong symbol. But certainly they will be represented in uh, the French uh, part.